Hi everyone, um, my name is Arissa and I'm one of the chemistry tutors with Lantana and today we're going to be looking at topic six, so rates of reaction and we're going to start off with looking at the first SL subtopic, so 6.1. So let's get started then. One of the main things that you need to be aware of for 6.1 is collision theory. So collision theory tells us about the requirements for a reaction to occur. So when two particles collide, what do they need in order to be able to generate a reaction? So the first one is that they have to collide with the right collision geometry. What this means is that they must collide in the right orientation. So their reactive centers or their functional groups must come into direct contact, which is what you can see from this image over here. So when you've got the reactive centers uh, colliding, as you can see in this part over here, that generates um, a reaction. So collision geometry is the first requirement. The second requirement is that the molecules must collide with sufficient energy to overcome the energy barrier or to have an energy greater than the activation energy. So the activation energy is the minimum energy required to start a reaction. So for um, a collision to generate a reaction, it needs to have more energy than the activation energy. Good, so those are the two main principles of collision theory. So next up, let's have a little bit of a more in-depth look at rate. So in terms of a definition on rate, rate is the change in concentration over the change in time. We know that the unit for concentration is moles per decimeters cubed, and the unit for time that we use is seconds. So we're gonna divide concentration by time. And essentially the unit that that yields us is moles per decimeters cubed per second. All right, so let's have a bit of a better look at some graphs then. So we've already spoken about the formula for rates. Now, there are two different types of rates that you could be asked to calculate looking at some graphs. So let's have a quick look at these graphs first of all. So this first graph shows the rate of reaction according to a reactant. Because as a reaction goes on, we know that the concentration of a reactant decreases. So that's what you can see over here. In the second graph over here, as the reaction goes on, the concentration is increasing. So this tells us that this is a product curve. The reason that both of these curves plateau is because esen essentially at one point we sort of run out of reactants to turn into products. So that's why we get the plateau in both of those different curves. All right, let's look at how we can calculate the average rate of reaction and the instantaneous rate of reaction. So the average rate of reaction is going to be the total change in concentration over the total time taken. So for example, if we look at this product curve, you'd be looking at the change in concentration from this point right at the start to this point right at the end. So you're looking at the total change in concentration over the total time. If, however, let's say you were asked for the instantaneous rate of reaction at, let's say, 10 seconds. So let's say over here, that's 10 seconds on my x-axis. So it's going to be this point over here. In order to work out the instantaneous rate of reaction, what we need to do is we need to work out the gradient at that point of the curve. So I've just drawn a tangent, and I'm going to work out the change in concentration and divide that by the change in time. So essentially, I'm looking to find the gradient of the curve at that point, at that moment in time that we've been asked for, and then that'll give me the instantaneous rate of reaction. Okay, so next up, we're looking at Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution tells us the distribution of molecules at any one particular point according to their kinetic energy. So if we have a look at this curve over here, the area under the curve represents the number of particles, the density of particles at any one particular point of energy. 
The x-axis is energy, or most specifically kinetic energy. And the y-axis is the number of particles, or another way that we can phrase that is like particle density. It just tells us about the number of particles occupying any particular energy at any one point. Most importantly, on the x-axis, there will always be an activation energy threshold. So this is going to be Ea. Particles that have more energy than the activation energy, so to the right of the threshold, are going to be the particles that are able to react. So this shaded region over here tells us about the proportion of particles that are actually going to be able to have enough energy to react. All right. So there are two main um, Maxwell-Boltzmann curves that you need to be able to draw. So you need to draw the original and then these two particular conditions. So the first condition that we're going to look at is how the curve changes with the addition of a catalyst. So a catalyst is something that speeds up the rates of reaction and is not actually consumed in the reaction itself. So it's kind of like a third party that helps out with that reaction. Since it's kind of a third party that speeds up the rate of reaction, it doesn't actually change the shape of our curve. So the shape of our curve is going to remain the same. What the catalyst does do, however, is it moves our activation energy barrier, the threshold, to a lower point. So now we've got a lower activation energy. And that's why if you have a look, with a catalyst, more particles are going to have sufficient energy to react. So always remember that a catalyst, the way that it speeds up the rate of reaction is by lowering the activation energy through offering an alternative pathway. So let me just write that down pathway. Good. So always remember, it doesn't change the shape of the curve, it only shifts the activation energy threshold. The next condition that we need to be aware of is an increase in temperature and how that changes our Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So remember, with an increase in temperature, you're going to get the particles increasing in kinetic energy. So they're going to have more kinetic energy as a whole. So therefore, the main thing that you need to be aware of is that our curve shifts to the right. So two main changes. It shifts to the right, or rather the peak shifts to the right. So you can see that shift to the right over there. And the curve also flattens. So it flattens and it shifts to the right. And what this means now is that more particles have sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy barrier. So here, the activation and energy barrier hasn't changed, but our particles have increased in energy to be able to get themselves past that threshold. So there's more particles now past the threshold. So the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is actually really important because it's one of the most commonly assessed parts of 6.1. So I've taken um, this screenshot of the most recent IB papers, so 2019. And what you're asked here is to sketch Maxwell-Boltzmann energy distribution curves at two temperatures. So they've given you the axes and you've got to draw the temperatures. Note, however, that they've told you that temperature 2 is higher than temperature 1. So we're always going to start off by drawing our regular Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curves, like so. And it's always worth noting on the axes where your activation energy threshold is going to be. So this is going to be T1. And T2, which is at a higher temperature, remember, is going to be flatter and my peak is going to shift to the right. So let me try to draw that out. So it's going to look something a little bit more like this. Cool. All right. So don't forget to label them. So this is going to be T1 and this is going to be T2. And I always say to shade in this region and it's just kind of worth labeling that these are the particles that are able to react. So particles that react. Perfect. 
perfect. And that's a really simple two mark. So it's definitely worth getting really familiar with the shapes of the curves. The other potential question that you can get asked about Maxwell Boltman is actually what the axes are. So if you remember, our x axis is always going to be energy. So let's have a look. So it's either going to be B or D. And our y axis was the number of particles or the density of particles. So the most appropriate answer here is going to be probability density. So that's going to be D. Perfect. All right, let's move on to the last bit then. So what we're gonna look at next are factors that increase the rate of reaction. So how can we increase the rate of reaction? The first factor is increasing the concentration of reactants. So when you have more reactant particles in a particular space, these particles are going to come into collision a lot more frequently, and therefore there's going to be a higher probability that those collisions uh, result in a successful uh, reaction. So increased frequency of collisions is the reason why increasing the concentration of reactants will increase the rate of reaction. In a reaction that is entirely gas-based, so where the reactants and the products are all gases, increasing the pressure, so reducing the volume, increasing the pressure, will cause those gas molecules to also collide more frequently, and that's going to increase the probability of a successful collision as well. Increasing the temperature, as we saw from our Maxwell-Bortman curve, is also going to result in particles having a greater amount of energy. So that's a good thing for two reasons. So first of all, more particles are going to have sufficient energy to pass the activation energy threshold. And also, we know that with greater kinetic energy, they're also going to come into collisions a lot more frequently. So the chance of getting a successful collision is a lot higher. So two reasons for increasing, uh, why increasing temperature increases the rate of reactions, right? Increased collisions and also they have more energy to overcome the activation energy barrier. And last but not least, increasing the surface area by reducing particle size. So for example, compared to like, let's say, a chunk of a reactant, crushing it into like a powder, that has a lot more surface area is going to increase the likelihood of success, uh, successful collisions as well. So increasing surface area is the last factor that also increases the rate of reaction. Perfect, so that's the end of our session on 6.1. Thank you so much for tuning in. Do have a look on our website for further details about online resources such as this one, and as well as one-to-one uh, -one support via online tuition and our revision courses as well. I'll see you for the next episodes. Bye.